<coughs> turn with me to Psalms 23, verse 5. We might have to do a year in the Bible again just so people remember Bible stories. <laughs> Amen. Those were some tough ones, huh? Especially the last two. This morning, as we conclude this series, I want to speak to you on this thought. Your table is ready. Psalms 23, verse 5 says this. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for this, this, this day that you've blessed us with. How good and pleasant it is, Lord God, when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. And Lord, you said it was good when we go to the house of the Lord. And so, Father, this morning we ask that you would speak to us through your word. Help us to understand it. Help us to get it into our spirits and into our hearts. And help us to live it out boldly for you. We love you. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Your table, how many of you at Thanksgiving time or Christmas time change your tablecloth to reflect the holidays? Some of you do. Your table is the centerpiece of your home. A lot of things happen around the table. You've had great conversations around the table. You had the conversation when your son or your daughter sat down at the dinner table and said, Mom or Dad, I've got news to tell you. Um, I'm in, I'm on, um, I'm, I've met someone, and I think this person's the one. Our mom and dad, we've been married for some time, and congratulations, you're going to be grandparents. Or, hey, you, you've heard a lot of conversations at the table. The table's an important centerpiece in a home. But your table is ready. How many of you love going to the restaurant to be met by the host or the hostess, only to hear, please wait here, sir or ma'am, while we prepare your table? Right? They're preparing your table, and you're going to have a 25, 35, 45 minute wait. And you don't mind waiting because you know the food's good. That's why you go to that restaurant. And they prepare the table for you, and they come back and they say, Mr. Warren, your table's ready. Follow me. And you follow the host or the hostess. And as you're walking and following the host or the hostess to your table, you see that they are going to sit you next to a family or people that you do not like, and they do not like you. <coughs> Just last week, that very family or that very person said something awful about you, doesn't like your family, smeared your name <coughs> all over social media, and you're just like, I've got to sit here. And you're looking around, and you're wondering if you could ask the host or the hostess, is there, could I sit somewhere else? No, because your table, that table's been prepared for you. You don't get a choice of where you sit. That table, that particular table, when you came in and you said, when they said, how many is in your party? Five, six, whatever. That particular table has been prepared for you. The host or the hostess did not know that you had a problem with them of people sitting next to you. So at that moment, you have a choice. You can throw a fit, get mad, storm out and go to McDonald's, or you can suck it up, buttercup, and sit at the table that's been prepared for you. How many of you know this morning the table, you don't have a choice at the table for the table that's been prepared. You have a choice if you're going to sit or not. <clears throat> you, the, the Lord, we gotta, I'm, I'm going to explain what this, what this means in context here in a moment. God cares for the needs of his children even as evil forces attempt to destroy your life and events, or your life and soul. He cares about you. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. What shall we then say to those things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charges against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or, or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We could drop Mike right there and say, memorize that, for that is what your life's going to be about. And I promise you, if we ever adopted this scripture, then there's nothing that's going on around us that's ever going to help us, understand, help us get out of the love of God. We understand that he loves us no matter what. And all this evil going on around us, even if the people you're sitting next to don't like you, God, you're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Amen? So I can sit at my table in comfort. I can sit at my table at ease. I don't care what everybody around me is saying. We are confronted daily by Satan. And we are surrounded by an ungodly society. God sustains believers physically and spiritually. And it's at his table that he gives us what we need so that we can, so that we can live and enjoy his presence. How many of you have ever been, have, have growing up, when your mom and your dad had, or mama or your daddy or all of them together, or whoever's table you were at, how many of you remember the days when you had to be excused from the table? You sat there and you had the dinner prepared for you and they said to you, don't you get up from my table. It was considered rude. And you had to say, excuse me, could I be excused from the table? Friends, how many times has God invited us to come and dine and we just leave the table because we wanted to? When it's him who's, who's preparing, making the preparations. You know, my sister, is, is it your first time here today? Sister Cheryl? It is. And she gets to go home with a turkey. But you know what? She didn't know she was coming to get a turkey today. And I didn't know she was coming today. She didn't prepare that turkey. She didn't prepare that table. But she came, and she sat at a table that was prepared for her, and she gets something, she gets to benefit something that was prepared for her. It, she didn't get to choose that. It just happened. That's what God does for us every single day. There's a table that's been prepared for you and I every single day. That's why he desires for you and I to come and send, spend time with him. He gives us what we need <clears throat> at the table. And it helps sustain us so that we can live and enjoy his presence every single day. <clears throat> First thing I want to look at this morning about the table is number one, when you come to the table, God, Jesus, our butler, our helper, our, our father, our, our, our brother, he comes and says, here, take your seat. Make yourself comfortable at my table. But Lord, how can I be comfortable when I don't like that person over there at that table, I'm sorry. And then you know what I feel like the Lord says to us? That table's not for you. That table is for them. This table's been prepared for you. Are you going to focus on what's on everybody else? How many of you have been someplace? I've done it. You're like, you see the waiter or the waitress bringing out somebody's food for somebody else's table, and you're like, ooh, what are they eating? And it looks good, but then you think you want what they ordered. But then you're like, no, I'm going to eat something else because that's not prepared for you. It's prepared for them. And when, my wife I, is the greatest person to go on a date with because all she'll order is a salad or soup. Praise God. She's, a, uh, she's an expensive date because she's, she's valuable. But money-wise, she don't cost a whole lot for me to take out. Hallelujah. Now, when she takes me out, she took me out last night. She pays dearly. Hallelujah. Praise God. El Patio is really good, by the way, amen, and hot food, yeah. But take your seat, sit down. And so you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. we got to understand the context of what this means. The Hebrew word neged means in the presence of. It also means opposite or against. In other words, neged implies a confrontational stance. And so the psalmist removes the assumption of confrontation by putting one word in front of prepare. 
He removes away the offensive nature of this context when he puts one word in front. He says, you. Who's you? God. God, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. In other words, you can get mad at me if I prepare. Gabe can get mad at me if I prepare a table for him. And right next to him is Jessica. And he can't stand the, the carpet that Jessica walks on. He can't stand the air she breathes. He can get mad at me for putting him at that seat. But the psalmist removes the, the, connotation, the confrontational aspect of Negev when he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The, word, the Hebrew word for before me is lefani, which means in front of. And this isn't a confrontational way. So let me bring some clarity to this. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies is understood as a kind of peace offering. Just like when a couple, a married couple, that ha- is having fights with each other, and they make they 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 they, they think that Pastor Jack is uh, the, is going to help them. You know what I oftentimes do? You too. Come here, real quick. You two just got married, so I'm going to use you. Watch. This is what I do. Okay? Dassey and Adam have been fighting. So I have a seat. This is your table. Have a seat. Get closer. But I don't like him. He's, I'm mad at him. Hold hands. Hold hands. Now, they got a choice right now. When they've come to me for marriage counseling, this table's been prepared for them. They can either get mad and leave because that's not what they wanted to hear from pastor. Or they can sit at the table that's been prepared for them as a peace offering. Because I do this every time someone comes to me. So if you come to me for marriage counseling, guess what? You're going to get to do this. And I have them look at each other in the eyes and tell each other what it was that drew their affection. What it was that drew their attention. Why it was that they fell in love in the first place. And when you start to see tears come down their eyes and they remember the day when they said, you know what, I love her or I love him. Man, he caught my eye. Was it the red hair? Was it the beard? Was it the twinkle in his eye? Was it the dimples in her smile? She don't have dimples, but what was it? But at that moment, that table becomes a table of peace offering. Now, the table's been prepared before me in the presence of my enemies as an offer of peace. At that moment, you're no longer responsible for how that other table responds to you. If we're sitting here in a peace offering gesture and one of them adamantly refuses to accept this peace offering, the one that's offered it is now no longer held, uh, held accountable for the other's actions. Thank you, guys. Don't ever, don't ever have to come to my office, okay? Keep Jesus first, and you'll be good. Hallelujah. A table is set before me and my enemies for us to sit together and peacefully resolve our differences. When I was getting ready to graduate high school, my dad asked me, he said, Son, what is the one wish that you have for your high school graduation? I said, I would love for you, my sister, my stepmom, my mom, and my stepdad, I would love for all of us to have dinner at the table. That was my wishes. And it happened. It happened as a form of peace offering. And because the table, they didn't prepare that table. But they came as guests, and there was healing that happened at that table. It's a gesture of peace. If your enemies refuse the gesture of peace, they will have to watch you eat. They'll have to watch you eat. I'm sitting down. (laughs) It's an offer of peace to the table next to me. Those people have said a lot of bad things. They don't like me. They wish I'd leave town. But I'm sitting here in peace. The gesture of peace has been offered. 
And if they just throw a fit, they're going to have to watch me eat anyway. Amen? I'm going to eat in peace. I'm going to eat in comfort because I'm not accountable for their actions any longer. Amen? Practice that this week when you sit down at a table for Thanksgiving and you might be sitting with some family members that you really just don't like. You're not doing it. You're not sitting there eating out of arrogance. You're not, doing it, you're not doing it out of anything other than obedience to your Father in heaven who prepared the table for you. You know, it would be completely rude if I showed up at my sister's house on Thursday for Thanksgiving and here she's went through all this work to prepare a table and then I get there with my family and I say, you know what, I don't want to sit at your table. That'd be so rude. My goodness, friends, do we know, do you know that every Sunday when we gather, God has prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies? And when we come in and say, I don't like the songs you're singing, I don't like what you're preaching, I don't like that this and I don't like that, you are insulting the one who prepared the table for you. Amen. Are you with me this morning? It's not my preference. I don't care. You didn't prepare the table. He did. The angry table guests will either repent, make things right, or get up and leave. And in spite of them, understand something. True followers of Christ are made to triumph in the very presence of their foes. Why do people get so mad at you? Even when you are God, they see God just blessing you and blessing you, and you see people throw fits. Well, I can't understand why Jessica gets to do this. I've done this with me. I've done it as many years as her. Listen, as long as you're sitting at the table that God's prepared for you, there's going to be haters. They're going to have something to say. But you can either continue to focus on what God's doing, or you can get distracted by the naysayers. Amen? I'm sorry. Your glare at me is not bothering me anymore. I'm enjoying this turkey. I'm sorry. Your glare, the things you're talking, I hear you. I hear you, but I'm, I hear him more. Because I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing the overflow, not your overflow. Your overflow has done bored me enough. I'm done annoyed with all your, in, all your insults and all the garbage you say about me. I'm done with that because I'm sitting in the presence of my enemies, and I'm enjoying a feast that God's prepared for me. Amen? Amen. So don't you stop getting caught up in all the things around you. Take your seat. In spite of them, your enemies will watch God's favor on your life and how he provides for you, defends you. And if your en enemies don't get right, they will face their maker and they'll face their judgment. Matthew 25, verse 31 through 36 says this. When a son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Stop, underline that, because they're right there in the same area. Come, you who are blessed by my father, the ones that are on the right hand, Sorry, left-handed. Sorry, goats. You're not getting this blessing. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Oh my gosh, we could preach this for all, the, rest of the rest of the time. It was the sheep who did that for Jesus, not the goats. The goats just like to be in the, in the, uh, in the area to, uh, uh, to, to see what's going on, to gripe about what's going on, to complain about what's going on. But it was the sheep who gave him, gave him something to eat when he was hungry. It was the sheep who gave him something to drink when he was thirsty, not the goats. Look, we're entering into a season, and I honestly believe this, you, and I've said this. We're in, the, we're in the last days. God's waking up his church. Revival is here, and it's coming. He's sending an awakening to this nation, and he's going to begin to separate sheep from goats. Sheep from goats. <clears throat> I want to be on his right hand. God, I want to be your right-hand man. I don't want to be left. All you left-handed people, that has nothing to do with you about if you're left-handed or not. All right? So understand, you can go ahead and eat in peace at the table regardless of your enemy's decisions. Number two, your seat is reserved 
for you. You know, I, I know that Thursday, I'm going to sit, I'm going to go to a house. It's my sister's house. And I don't, I don't even have to be there yet, but I know there's a seat that's been reserved for me. Just like if you come to my house to eat, there's a seat reserved for you. Just like you look around this room, I told a man I ran into in Walmart yesterday. I hadn't, ran, I hadn't, I've met him once. He bought on my shoulder that once that I met him. I prayed with him. Haven't seen him in about three months. And he said, Pastor, I really need God again. I said, I'm saving a seat for you. I'm saving a seat for you. Friends, do you know that God is saving a seat for people to attend, to be here in this place? Your dinner guests, you know whose job it is to invite people to the dinner? Ours, everyone's. Amen? How many of you been to the new restaurant in town? El Patio or El Patio? How many have been there? Am I the only one? Oh, it's good. You should go. When Dairy Queen opened up, how many of you guys told people about Dairy Queen? Yeah? Dairy Queen's open. You got to go check out Dairy Queen. When KFC opened in DeRitter, the, the line was so long for people to get to Dairy Queen. Can you even get into a Chick-fil-A? Chick-fil-A's line is so long. Can I tell you, the church of God serving up a, a whole lot better things than Chick-fil-A. Amen? A whole lot better things than KFC. Because with him, taste and see that he is good, it will leave you, it will be finger licking good. Yeah. Your, your seat is reserved for you. You're an honored guest. And understand when, when the psalmist David is saying, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies, you got to understand that you are an honored guest at this table. David says, you anoint my head with oil. Do you, do you understand that this refers to a practice for honored guests at a banquet? You anoint my head with oil. This isn't just for anybody. That's why many are called, but few are chosen. You anoint my head for, with oil is, is reference to a practice for honored guests at a banquet. God's favor and blessing through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Listen to me. Don't drink what they are drinking at the other tables. That table isn't for you. When we... <laughs> How many of you tell your kids when you go to to the restaurant, hey, order water. It's cheaper, right? Good Lord, why would we, want, why would we pay two ninety nine dollars for a glass of tea or two ninety nine dollars for a Coke when it only costs them $0.25 cents a cup, $0.30 cents a cup? Do you know water is symbolic to the Holy Spirit? I'm going to help you with some budgeting right now. You're going to save a lot of money if you just drink water at the restaurants. Doesn't, the, Lord, doesn't the, the Bible tell us to drink, to, if we come and take a drink of him, we'll never thirst again? Drink of this water, drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. And I like it with a little twist of lime, but I like, it, I like what he provides with, just a, with a whole lot of twist of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to keep drinking of that. Don't drink, don't look at that other table. Was at a restaurant the other night with a couple pastors. And one of them said, man, look at them drinks some people got behind us. It had to be the biggest martini or margarita glass I've ever seen. It looked good. For it smelled fruity. You could smell it. It just wasn't for me because I'm not at that table. And if I was at that table, that's not what I'm drinking. Amen? Don't look at what was on the other tables and think that you got to have that. A table's not prepared for you. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Don't drink what's other, on other tables. Get the water that God has for you. Be filled in the Greek means an ongoing way of life involving repeatedly being filled. Can I tell you this morning, when the reason I wanted to linger on that last song is I'm tired of Christians, a lot of Christians just saying, well, I was filled once. 
Be filled with the Spirit means an, a daily filling of the Holy Spirit, a daily filling of His presence, a daily filling. It's not a one-time occurrence where, yeah, one time I prayed, and one time I might have prayed in tongues. One time I felt the goose pimples of the Holy Spirit. One time I might have even danced. One time I might have did this. One time I might have done that. It is a daily involving infilling every single day. And it gets better and better every single day. Amen? Be filled with the Spirit. Not a one-time event. At this table, you will be filled. You will be refreshed. You will be renewed. Even if those around you don't like it or approve of it. <coughs> Sit and enjoy. Sit and enjoy. As an honored guest, you will receive his oil and his anointing. Understand me this morning. You need the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. You need that. We all need that. Well, you may say, well, pastor, I'm not ready for that. Well, friends, he's serving it up. He's serving up a full course meal. You know, the only thing on this, on this Thanksgiving dinner table this, this Thursday that I will not eat of and partake of because I think it's nasty it's cranberry sauce. That junk is disgusting to me. But everything else, praise God. I'm going to hurt myself. No, I'm not. I'm not going to be a glutton. I've lost some weight, and I'm going to leave it off. Praise the Lord. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. So sit and enjoy. God, understand something. God spoke, to this to me, spoke this to me Wednesday in the woods so very clearly. He's tired of spiritual anorexia and spiritual bulimia. Spiritual anorexia and spiritual bulimia. He's tired of people just going through the motions and starving themselves spiritually. Then he's tired of people getting so fed, so fed, so fed, only to gag themselves and make themselves throw up when they leave. He says to taste and see that he is good. Taste and see that he is good. Psalms 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. I'm at this table. I'm not taking refuge in who don't like me at the other table. I'm not taking refuge even if the waiter has a little attitude. I'm not taking refuge in anything else. I'm taking refuge in him. Because in him we live and move and have our being. I'm going to sit right here. In his safety, I'm going to sit right here in the shadow of his wings, and I'm going to sit right here in his provision and in his promises. And I'm going to receive the Holy Ghost. I'm going to receive the fire right here at this table in this seat of honor. One of the, guy, one of the Bible stories that we mentioned up here today that no one got right was Mephibosheth. He was dropped as a baby by his nanny, and he was a nurse's maid, nanny, whatever you want to call her. Crippled. And he was excommunicated from the castle. He was kicked out. And he sent to a place called Lodabar, which means a place of no belonging. And then David becomes king. David is now in the palace. And David says, is there anyone of royalty left? I want to honor this table. Yes, your honor. Yes, your king. Yes, your majesty. There's one. But people forgot about him. His name's Mephibosheth. And they begin to tell David the story. How the nurse, the nanny, went to pick him up. And she dropped him. And he crippled his legs. And because he was crippled and an outcast now, because you're royalty, you don't belong if, you're, if you've got flaws and you're messed up, you don't belong at this table, you've got to go. Sends him to Lodabar, a place of no belonging. David sends out the party. He said, go get him. Go and get him. And they go and get Mephibosheth. Can you imagine the fear? Can you imagine the anxiety going on in Mephibosheth's life? Mephibosheth, the king has requested you to come back to the king's table. Uh-uh. Last time I was there, they kicked me out. 
because I can't walk. I'm crippled. David does just what King Jesus would do. He welcomes him into the palace. Opens up, pulls about the chair and says, look, this seat's been reserved for you. It's a place of high honor. You're going to sit at my table. You're not eating crumbs off the floor anymore. You're not eating trash in the dump anymore. You're eating the best food that is brought to this table. You're eating of the king's food. And Mephibosheth was restored back to royalty because somebody looked past his insecure or his, looked past his um, handicap and welcomed him back to a place of royalty. Come on, friends. That's what this is all about. Amen. Number three. Don't go away hungry. You know, you can go to the Chinese restaurant today, you can eat the buffet, and about an hour later you can be hungry again, right? There's just something about that Chinese buffet. It, just, it fills you up real quick, but whew, it's fast moving. <laughs> just check and see if you're all awake. Mama used to say something at our table, and they're going to say it this week, I know. If you leave this table hungry... It's your own fault. Because there's always been more than enough prepared. And after you have eaten whatever you've placed on your plate and you were told to eat it all, here, you want seconds? No, I'm full. If you leave this table hungry, it's your own fault. Matthew 5 verse 6 says this, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Listen to me, With this, without this intense hunger and desire for God and His righteousness, you will not pursue a deeper relationship with God. The foundational requirement for all godly living is to hunger and thirst for righteousness. I like Psalms 42.1. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, for you, O God. Remember that song? As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul long after you. Is that hunger there? Are you longing for more? As, as, as we're getting ready to end 2019, how you finish the year will de determine what you see in the next year. What are you hungry for? A child will say, well, I'm hungry. And a parent asks the child, well, what are you hungry for? And a kid says, well, I don't know. I just know that I'm hungry. Here's the problem with today's complacent and apathetic church. You're hungry for something. You just don't know what you're hungry for. So you settle for whatever is put in front of you. Left, do you understand something today? Understand this. If you do not plan your meal intentionally, you're going to eat junk. If you go to the grocery store without a grocery list, you're going to buy things that you didn't want. You're going to walk down that snack aisle and you're going to see Nabisco and it's going to cry out to you. You're going to see whatever, it cry, all the cookies and all that, and all it's going to cry out to you. And you went in for three items. Your wife told you to get soap, milk, and eggs. And you come home, spent $65 with muffins, little Debbie's, and all these other things, and you got home and you're like, what in the world did I buy all this? Because you didn't go with a list. You didn't prepare. And just like food, if you, if you ask a child, and some of you are going to leave here today and you're going to say, hey, honey, where do you want to go eat? I don't know, whatever you're hungry for. That's the conversation I promise you has had today before you leave this parking lot. Where do you want to go eat today? Some of you have already predetermined that. You already know you're going to Wagon Master because that's where you go every Sunday. You already know what you're going to order. Honey, where do you want to eat today? I don't know. Where do you want to eat? And if you say McDonald's, oh, I don't mind going to McDonald's. Well, you just said you didn't know where you wanted to eat. And if you were to ask, if you were to, if you were to say every single day, and we have these conversations with God, God, I want you to do something. I just don't know what I want you to do. God, I'm hungry for you. But then when God provides some food, I don't like that. I wanted a fried turkey, not a roasted turkey. But he prepared it for you. 
in the pres- and he placed it on the table for you in the presence of your enemies. And you're saying you don't like it? You know, there's a day coming where people are going to say, Lord, I did this in your name, and I did that in your name. I did this, this, and this. And he's going to say, you know what? I prepared a table for you. And all you did was gripe and complain about what I put in front of you. Depart from me. We become spiritual junk food junkies. In the midnight hour, instead of praying, we go to the refrigerator. I've learned to practice that whenever I can't sleep. It's not because I'm hungry for what's in the fridge. I've learned that when I can't sleep, more than likely God's trying to speak. More than likely he's trying to get my attention. I woke up yesterday morning early, something on my heart. My wife, she's like, you don't ever get up this early on Saturday. I woke up early this morning. I'm, it's shocking her because she usually beats me up. I'm telling you, there's something I'm hungry for. And there's nothing in the refrigerator that's going to satisfy it. There's something I'm hungry for. And I'm adopting what Mama used to say. Uh, don't, if you leave from this table hungry, that's your own fault. Anytime someone goes to church and say, well, I'm not going to that church anymore because I'm not being fed. Friends, I'm going to say this with as much love as I possibly can say it this morning. Babies get fed. Adults eat. Amen? Babies get fed. Adults eat. You don't, you don't have to tell me to spend time eating my word every day. If I'm hungry for God, if I want to hear God speak, it's found right here. If I want a prophecy, it's right here. Praise God, with it, and, he, there, and he uses prophets all the time. I'm not, and I love the prophets, and I, I love all the fivefold. Next year we're going to get into a teaching on the fivefold. What, uh, uh, tr- the true teaching of the fivefold ministry gifts, because I don't believe anybody, I don't believe that we, uh, that we understand it completely. But when I need a word, I'm not going to a podcast. I'm not going to a book. I'm not going to anybody else. I'm going to the one who prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Hungry? You know what people are hungry for today? Identity. They're hungry for acceptance. They're hungry for value. They're hungry for self-gain. Hungry for wealth. They're hungry for our own way. What are you hungry for? I don't know. I'm just hungry. How many of you have ever said, you know, I want something. I just don't know what it is. The other day, Christina said something. I think it was you that said it in the house. I'm hungry for something sweet. I just don't know what it is. I said, well, I'm sweet. That's not what I mean. Do you know he satisfies every one of your desires he, and needs? He satisfies it at the table. Lastly, living a full life. Walking in the overflow. You anoint my head with oil. And my cup overflows. Because of what he's doing in my life, I'm walking by my brother. And he's going to get some overflow. Because of God's pouring into me, I'm not telling him to stop at the rim, the brim of the cup. Keep pouring. Keep pouring. And let the overflow. Let the overflow. Let the overflow. Let the overflow. Let the overflow, right? Let the overflow. Let the overflow. He's going to keep pouring. So many times we though we come to the house of God, we come to a service. Fill me up, Lord. Okay, I'm full. Done. I've got mine. It's time for me to go now. God's not wanting just to fill you. He's wanting to fill you to overflow. Every single one of you in this room this morning has something to offer to other people. And it's out of your overflow. Amen? Well, Pastor, I'm tired. Get full. Pastor, I'm burned out. Get full. Pastor, I I feel depressed. Get full. Pastor, I have anxiety. Get full. 
Because if you're full, you have, there's no room for anything else if you're full of Him. There's no room for fear. There's no room for anxiety. There's no room for depression. There's no room for oppression. There's no room for any of that if you're full. Well, I struggle with this and I struggle with that. There's no room for those struggles if you're full of Him. You're living in the overflow. And that's where God desires you and I to be, is to live in the overflow. And uh, guess what? Paul, walking by someone and his shadow heals somebody. That wasn't Paul. That was Paul's overflow. His overflow. How cool would it be if you walked by somebody and they got healed? Boy, you'd get out. You'd jump out of your skin. Then you'd try to analyze and figure it out. You can't figure out moves of God. <coughs> Live in, living a full life. My cup overflows, literally translates, my cup is an abundant drink. My cup is an abundant drink. Oh, the party was great as long as the keg was full. But when it ran out, I'm to the next party. Right? My drink with him is not dependent on what you offer or don't offer. Amen? Amen? Because there's this, this Holy Ghost party. There's none like it. There is none like it. He told that woman at the well, drink of me and you'll never thirst again. She fell into that big, huge thirst trap of trying to get her life filled with all those other men. And he came and just read her mail and did it in a loving way, but confronted it, spoke the truth. And he said, sweetheart, you thirsty for all those other men? And then the one you're with right now is not even your husband? You know what everybody calls that today? He didn't call her that. He said, stop thirsting after that. Take a drink of my water. You'll never thirst again. That's what he told her. He did it in a more majestic way. I'm not majestic. Just breaking it down. We need to understand the great meaning of the cup. My cup overflows. What is a cup's use? I wanted to put cups up here today, and I just forgot. What's a cup's use? What good's a cup if it doesn't have something in it? I mean, if you go today to a restaurant and they bring you, and you say you want a glass of water, and they just bring you an empty cup, you're going to get a little upset and agitated. I want something in it. What you want in it? Water. The use of a cup. You drink from a cup. Understand why he's using this phrase. The Israelites, Israelites lived in a desert climate. If you're going to Israel with us this in, in February, you will see. Israelites lived in a desert climate. Water was one of the most precious commodities of all. To be given, to be given water was to give life to someone. Friends, you not only get to eat in the presence of your enemies, you also get to drink a spot of water. You get to enjoy it. Water is refreshing. Water is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. John 7, 37 and 38 says something to us. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to, to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Not only do you get to eat in the presence of your enemies, you get to drink even in the driest areas of life. How do you get that when everybody else is so dry? This is why even in church services you look around and you're like, Adam, why are you jumping up and down? I'm a little more reserved. Why are they doing that? Why is God blessing them? Drink for yourself. Amen? Drink for yourself. Isn't it interesting to me? It's interesting to me. I've been to college football games, NFL football games. How come it is that the cost of drinks are four or five times more in a stadium than they are outside? You're, you get thirsty in there. And unless you're like us, we smuggle in our bottles of water. 
I'm not paying $5 for a bottle of water. Are you serious? I'm paying my 99 cent, and I'm smuggling it in my shorts in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Don't, don't, don't judge me. Y'all do it at the movie theaters, too. I know you do. Y'all go to the Dollar Tree and buy the dollar candy, and you sneak it in your cargo pants or whatever. You make your wife carry a big purse. I know. <laughs> Y'all laughing because you do it. <laughs> but the price for something to drink inside a stadium, four and five times more than what it costs outside the stadium, and you'll pay it every time. But let Jesus Christ offer the living water for free. Oh, I got to be someplace. I got someplace to go. But it's at the table prepared for you. But I'm busy. I'm busy. But the table's been prepared for you. It's not entertainment, it's not amusement. Do a word study on the word muse and then add the word ah to it and see the difference in the two. This thing that we're doing with the Lord, this thing called Christianity, isn't about amusement or your feelings. He wants you to live in his overflow. God provides spiritual blessings to those who seek him daily. You may feel like you're in a dry place, but the Lord can quench your thirst. He will give you water even in the midst of a spiritual desert. And guess what? When, if you are thirsty and you're drinking of him and somebody else is in need, because of your drink of him and you're experiencing your overflow, you now get to provide something to drink for someone else. Amen? Most of us are satisfied with a full cup or a cup barely full. Well, that might be good enough for you, but it's not good enough for God. He wants you to live in his overflow. He delights in filling your cup to overflow. He delights in keep on and keeping on pouring and pouring and pouring. Do you realize that with the widow in the Old Testament, the oil only ran out when they ran out of vessels? Here's my cup, Lord. Fill it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Remember that old song? Bread of heaven, fill me till I want no more. Well, when I say that, I might not want no more, but he's going to keep filling because there's people around me that need it. He pours until the water overflows. He not only quenches our thirst, he does more than enough. He does more than we can do for ourselves. He does more than we deserve. Friends, our cup overflows so that in the overflow, others will be blessed as well. I'm ask our worship team to come. Jesus. Go into uh, Fill Me Up. Just start playing it softly. Come on, I'm just going to ask real quick. Please, no one talking. If you've got to leave, I understand it. You won't offend me. But I know he desires to pour out his spirit on some people today. Some of you are not even half full. You're living on experiences with the Lord from years ago. It's not sustainable. I need the overflow. I need the overflow. First and foremost, this morning, if you're here and you're not, you're not a believer, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, today is the perfect day to say, Lord, I want to experience you like never before. I want to invite you to take over my life. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Pastor, pray for me. I need Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Do me a favor, all of us stand. Amanda, bring your baby. I'm going to ask some people to pray for, for this baby. This baby had a pot of boiling water spill over on its head. But you know what? 
And the doctor said if that doesn't get healed by this next week, they're going to do surgery, skin graft. How many of you believe that the overflow of his power and his presence can touch this baby? Look at this face. You see this face? You may not like looking at it, but this face has no scars. But this face encountered four, third and fourth degree burns. And I never, ever had to go to a doctor because God healed me instantly. Eyesight restored. Skin grew back in front of my parents' face, my sister's face. They saw the skin come back just like that. My dad asked me when it happened, do you want to go to the hospital? I said, no. I want you to call some people that know how to pray. I was 17 years old. Call some people that know how to pray. And I sat down at my daddy's table, table. And they prayed over me. They anointed me. And I couldn't see, but I began to see. Skin was gone. Skin grew back. Just like that. And that can happen for this baby today. In the overflow. So I'm going to ask some of you to lay hands on that child. The rest of you. I'm going to ask you, as they begin to sing, Lord, fill me.